intersection of positive psychology and estate planning. That's the subject of today's ACTEC Trust and Estate Talk. Welcome to ACTEC Trust and Estate Talk from the American College of Trust and Estate Council, a professional society of peer elected trust and estate lawyers in the United States and around the globe. This series offers professionals best practice advice, insights, and commentary on subjects that affect our profession and clients. And now, our ACTEC fellow host with today's topic. This is Stacy Singer, ACTEC fellow from Chicago. We will be discussing creative, positive experiences to develop well-being. To give us more information on this topic, you'll be hearing today from ACTEC fellow Richard Franklin of Washington, D.C., and fellow Ray Odom of Chicago, Illinois. Welcome, Richard and Ray. Thank you. Well, it's really exciting to be here, and I'm so excited to be here with you, Ray. You're such an expert on this subject. You know, historically, there's been so much focus about having uh, ways that people spend that are negative, you know, and we talk about that all the time in the trust and estates world, but there's never or there's not very much discussion or focus on positive ways to spend. And so it's really cool to have you here to talk about the, you know, positive experiences and ways that even down to the trust level could actually fund, you know, positive experiences that add to well-being. So what, what about some comments about that? Sure. I think, Richard, especially as you mentioned, as someone familiar with trust distributions and trust language, typically what we're trying to do is keep money away from beneficiaries, except when they're either doing behavior that we want to incent, which doesn't work very well, or when we are giving money because they reach a certain age that's kind of arbitrary. And I think the thing that's brilliant about your whole approach to this is the idea that we can actually fund or spend money on things that actually create a positive experience in the individual beneficiary. And that positive experiences, they will actually help that person become a better person. And not only better, Richard, but if I understand the idea of signature strengths, it's actually something that will allow them to increase their well-being, which you brought out uh, in prior conversations really is about being happier. It all ties into the idea that most people who are transferring money say, well, I just want them to be happy. And yet there's no format, there's no way to measure that, there's no way to talk about it. But I think when we talk about giving and spending money so people can do experiences or involve themselves in experiences that actually allow them to flourish in the strength and the interest that they have. Well, Richard, I think it adds a whole new twist and a much more positive approach to the don't give them money, it'll mess them up kind of thing. I agree, I agree. And so there's also lots of research, isn't there, to support these ideas related to spending money in a positive way that add to well-being. And this is something that probably most people are not aware of. Oh, that's absolutely right. And the research, it's not just a little research. Um, There's been over 150 psychology research studies done around the concept of how does spending money or involvement with money affect happiness. I mean, people would not realize that in, in you know, in our world of estate planning. And those things talk about, all those studies talk about the fact that there isn't just one kind of uh, approach to this, but that every approach that involves buying possessions tends to be less memorable, less experiential, and not as much happiness. Whereas an investment or spending that allows people to do things that, uh, and one study that particularly that they reference to is a study that says when you gift money for an experience, the person who has that experience feels closer to the giver, closer to the people they experience it with, and and listen to this, Richard, closer to mankind in general. It's like if you pay for someone to go to a U2 concert, they they wind up loving everybody, right? So I think that's that's the thing that benefactors ought to be trying to accomplish in the lives of their beneficiaries. I love it. I love it. I want, to, I want to come back to the point you made about strengths earlier and kind of delve into that a little bit more. But I also wanted to note that in the UK, 
I understand there's research there where the government essentially has created a system to put a monetary value on most things that the government would spend on as to how much it may increase well-being. And for example, some of the research reflects that spending like to go to an artistic performance like the symphony or to a sporting performance, to a soccer game, that in effect they have research to show that there's sort of an equivalent value of well-being benefit to that. But spending to go to a museum is double the well-being benefit. So the UK government would know that they spent a billion dollars on a soccer stadium versus a billion into museums, they get double the well-being benefit by spending on museums than they would the soccer stadium. And so the, the experience of going to the museum is, is a richer sort of experience according to this research than going to sporting performance or to the, the symphony. And I, I really think that's fascinating to drill down to that level to really look at what the value of uh, these experiences are. I think that's exactly right. And the point is strong because you're saying, look, this is an entire country. We're not talking about people spending a couple of dollars, $100,000 out of a trust. This is a countries that have, you know, in theory, trillions of dollars of flow. And what they're saying is, in order for people to not be sick, which has been the focus of everything, what we should focus on is increasing their well-being. We can measure that, and by giving them positive experiences that literally increase the elements of well-being that, that Seligman and other positive psychology uh, experts talk about, everything kind of rises. It's everything rises. Really interesting. They even write prescriptions in the UK to go to museums. Doctors do <laughs> prescribe it. You know, it's it's the connection to health is really you know interesting as well. I'll tell you about strengths for a moment. Martin Seligman, who is here in Philadelphia, where we are today, recording this, and considered the father of positive psychology. He and others developed 24 strengths, as sort of a model of signature strengths and they're grouped under six virtues. And the idea is that you use your strengths more and more, and you get, um, you build essentially psychological capital by using your strengths, not really focusing on weaknesses. And I've seen it in my own personal family, the intersection of strengths and experiences where I've traveled pretty extensively with my wife and two daughters overseas. And we've done a lot of traveling together, and my daughters are adults now. And I think that we really connected and bonded over traveling because we all share some of the same signature strengths. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, an appreciation for art and beauty and curiosity of, you know, with respect to the world and learning. And that when we travel, you know, we're going to museums, we're doing things like cooking experiences with chefs in different countries or, or polo matches or whatever. And this has really been a, you know, a big thing in our lives and I think a really amazing way to connect with, uh, with my daughters particularly. Absolutely. And probably allowed us to spend more time with them out of the country than we would if we had just stayed in the country and you know, trying to arrange them to come and visit with us and that sort of thing. So I think the experience is probably the best money that I've ever spent in my own little personal unit. Yeah, and that's such a great example because it, it you know, kind of brings a couple of things together. You have the idea that I want to develop the relationship. And you remember Seligman had his view of happiness said positive effect or emotions, engagement, and then positive relationships, the, the, the art, exactly. and then meaning and then accomplishment. And there is a way to measure well-being. And what you're saying is, not only did I kind of do something about it, but I could actually sense the increase in well-being. And that's so different from saying, let's not disperse money because after all, they could you know, have addictive behaviors or they, you know, they might spend some money on something that's incorrect. And for me, Richard, the, the ultimate example that what you're talking about is correct, actually, there's two things. Uh, being personal about it, you said, Ray, this signature strength thing actually works. I'm thinking, I'm not so sure. So I take the signature strengths test. It comes out what my strength was, and there's one, and it comes out like one of my strengths was spirituality. Uh, yours was culture. And I said, well, I'll think about the job I'm doing here and talking to people about this as a way to really get to the kind of the soul level 
of the, of the person. And when I did that, what I did became more interesting. I created, I had a better flow and I had positivity in my attitude about it rather than just getting through an outline to talk to people about estate planning. And I think the ultimate example that buying experiences makes sense is college. When people pay for their children to go to college, something, Richard, that everybody kind of intuitively thinks about and wants to do as a positive thing, it is positive and not because their kids get a degree, but because they have an experience that transforms and allows their signature strengths to play out into their lives. And that increases well-being. I love it. I love it. Also explain, I, I loved how you did the word play with benefactor. Could you explain that for a moment? Yes. You know, the whole idea is that people say, what's the goal of estate plan? Well, it's not for people to die. It's not to keep money away from kids. And it's not just to save taxes. The idea is benevolence in the word beneficiary. Uh, if you break them apart, the word bene means good. Volition means will, to will good. And so um, for benefactor, it means to be a good factor, to be a catalyst for good in the life of the beneficiary. And of course, Benny, good, fiduciary actually comes from life. Trying to give people a good life. And that's exactly what you're doing with your daughters as you're traveling. You're saying, I believe that this experience will actually get in the flow of your signature strengths. And at the end of the, the process, you're going to have a better, a good life. And it'll help make you uh, increase your well-being. I agree. Um, maybe we could also talk for a moment about if you have ideas about how people could actually employ this over time and develop sort of a thoughtful approach to doing it. You know, if they don't have specific ideas right on the tip of their you know, hands, maybe they should get coaching or yes. facilitator to actually be deliberate and intentional to come up with a plan. And it doesn't have to be all at once, but to think in terms of this is something you're looking at doing over the arc of your entire life expectancy. You know, be thoughtful about it. Absolutely, Richard. And that's a lot different from when you die and the by and by, maybe the kids will do something with this money. Agreed. I couldn't agree more. Give everybody a museum membership card. There you go. I think that would be the answer for a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you, Ray and Richard, for giving us more information on the intersection of positive psychology and estate planning. Thank you for listening to this episode of AgTech Trust and Estate Talk, the podcast series about wealth planning matters from the American College of Trust and Estate Council. To find an AgTech lawyer near you, visit ACTEC.org. Please subscribe to this series and leave us a rating or a review. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at AgTech Talk.